Hello everyone and welcome to our weekly discussion series that's hosted by the Chaldean Cultural Center in collaboration with U of M Detroit Center, Unique Voices in Films, and CMN TV. I'm your host, we am Nemo, and our guest today is Professor Paolo Bota. Welcome. Hello. Paolo was born in Cordoba, Argentina. He obtained a bachelor's in international relations at Cordoba Catholic University. After that, he moved to Egypt to study Arabic at the Arabic Language Center in Cairo, where he got an Arabic language diploma issued by the Egyptian Ministry of Higher Education in 2002. He works as a professor at Pontifical Catholic University in Argentina, and uh, recently the Chaldean Cultural Center sponsored a project that he began researching about a Chaldean community that has been long established in Argentina. This was such exciting work, and we will get to that in a minute. Um, but we we want to talk about how you got introduced to this project. In 2019, um, you reached out to the Chaldean Cultural Center and told us about these immigrants in Argentina. How did you learn about them? Well, hello. Thank you, Ryan, for having me here. Uh, well, it's, 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 it was just by chance. I'm on about... 15 years ago, I, I, I met one of the members of this community, Mr. Alejandro Zaparo. Uh, I, I work on Middle Eastern issues, and so he said that uh, his family was from Iran. And it was pretty interesting to me because uh, I, I wrote my PhD dissertation on Argentine and Iranian relations, and I never read about Iranians living in Argentina, and he said that uh, his family are Chaldeans, uh, they came from the northwest uh, part of Iran, near the Urum Lake, and there were a, a group of about 30 families who arrived to Argentina. He, so it was a very first contact. Then uh, we became very good friends with Alejandro, and he helped me to have uh, to improve my contacts and, and my knowledge about this community. And that's why I, I thought that uh, the Kazian Cultural Center would be interested in, in knowing a bit more about this part of the diaspora here in Argentina that nobody knows really that uh, this group of Kazian families are here. So I'm curious, did you know anything about Chaldeans prior to this introduction? Well, yes, about Chaldeans, yes. yes so I, I, I was, I'm, I'm pretty interested in that, about the, the uh, Oriental Christian communities. And actually, uh, I, I wrote a couple of, of, of works about the Chaldeans, I don't know, the, the Christians, the Oriental Christians here in Argentina. So I, I knew about Chaldeans, but not about Chaldeans living here in Argentina. Okay, so you were aware of them. So that actually made it more of an interest for you. Is this why you understood their ancient lineage and the fact that they're in Argentina? And then, um, you know, so you studied the Arabic language in Egypt. So this seems like there's a kind of interest that you have there. I'm curious, uh, what drew you to, to that area? It seems like you have a passion and interest in the Middle Eastern uh, world and the Arab world. Well, it's, it's, a, it's a funny story because, uh, as you can see, because of my, my surname, uh, I do not have Middle Eastern roots, but, but Italian roots. But when I was a kid, I wanted to become an archaeologist. That was my, my, my first lab and, uh, and my first the lesson. Secret. There's the secret. <laughs> That's the secret. That's about the Middle Ages, Middle Ages, Indiana Jones, and all those stuff. And so when I was about 16 years old, my, I began to study Arabic because I wanted to become an archaeologist. And then, you know, Iraq invaded Kuwait, then the tourist factory in Argentina. So when I finally finished high school, I decided that I was interested in the Middle East, but not in the historical Middle East, but in contemporary Middle East. So that's why I, I put my, my first. My, it's, it's, a, it's a simple explanation about why an Italian is interested in the Middle East region in Argentina. I, okay, this is all making sense because I I know the archaeologists that work in Iraq. Um, they're amazing. They're so in love with what they do. It's you can, you can feel it. I mean, you can see, you can feel it. And so once you have that feeling for archaeology, of course, you're going to be interested in topics related to ancient communities, especially. And especially in this case, this is kind of an archaeologist type of uh, research because we did not, we were not aware of them. And then based on what you said later, and we'll talk about it later, that they were not even really aware of us. Uh, but before we go in, into this, because it, 
once you learned about them, what what next steps did you want to do, and what was the challenge in pursuing that? Well, I think that one of the, the uh, I mean, uh, one of the things we, we have to bear in mind is that we have to begin from scratch because uh, we do not have many things about this community. I mean, just a couple of articles, but not in not in a very detailed way. And also, we have uh, we're facing again uh, what we can say, uh, what I call it a biological challenge because older generations are passing away. There are the, the people who have the knowledge, they are part of the heritage, the family memories, language even. So I think that uh, we have uh, one first first challenge is that we have to begin from scratch, but at, at, at the same time, at the same time, it's very exciting to begin a new field of research as the Caltean community here in Argentina. And also we, we, are, we, are, we have to work very quickly because uh, there are, we do not have time. We have to, to preserve uh, the memories of this community very, very, very quickly. Yeah, I remember that you had mentioned, and again, this was in 2019 that we had the initial um, connection, and you you talked about that the fact that the time is you know mo moving forward, and there's an older generation, um, and we were looking into it, and then COVID happened. Yeah. So COVID put everything on hold. Uh, you know. I know that this kind of work, people, I mean, Argentina is a big country, and so it's not like something that you could just drive to to this community. Um, so luckily, after the situation changed with the whole world and um, uh, restrictions were lifted, you and I reconnected about this topic because it always stayed in my mind. I thought, what a unique thing. I've never heard of these. And whoever I spoke to had never heard of, of a community that's in Argentina. How did they get there? What happened? How, uh, what do they speak today? How connected are they to their heritage? You know, um, and so we had so many questions. And so we decided, you know, we we wanted to sponsor the trip because we felt like, first of all, we felt that you would be so perfect um, to pursue it because your interest was so sincere. <laughs> We trusted that you're going to bring us the most fascinating information, which you have. And we're not even done yet, by the way. Um, you know, this is just the beginning of the whole process. But you, thanks to your efforts and your interest, you were able to initiate this and get us this far. So I really want to commend you for that. Um, it has made us, our community, happen, happy. And based on the responses that you said from them, it seems like it made them happy too. But tell us about the process of, what you had to do to get there. I know that you had to make an initial contact with one of the families. I mean, walk us through the process because really it's a very interesting story that does kind of have a beginning, middle, it doesn't have an end yet, but it does have a beginning. No. And a <laughs> yeah. Well, yes, you're right. The beginning was the contact with Mr. Alejandro Safarov. I said the person I, I met 15 years ago. Um, uh, I asked Alejandro to put me in contact with other members of other families. So that's, that was the, the first step. Uh, we began to, to gather uh, information about the families. Uh, as you probably imagine, not, not every family had the same I mean, uh, knowledge about the, their past. Some families are pretty aware of, and other families are not aware of. So it was, it was a, I kind of, we were as detectives just trying to find not only the families but the families who know about their heritage. So that that was the first the first thing. So the, the second thing we did was uh, just to it was quite easy at that time to identify where the majority of those families were and the majority of those families uh, when they arrived to Argentina settled down in, in the north part of the country in Jujuy province. Um, so it was quite easy because about 24, 30 families arrived uh, during the first three decades of the 20th century. And then, of course, other families moved to other cities in Argentina, but the core of the community is in Jujuy province, in the north part of the country. So, uh, first of all, contact with Alejandro Safarov, then identified the members of this community, third, uh, arriving to the conclusion that they were in, in, in El Carmen, which is a small city, in, in the Jujuy province, where this, uh, many of those families are. Um, so that, that was the first approach, yes, to identify where uh, this community was uh, settled when they arrived to Argentina and how many of those families uh, we can reach at, at this moment. 
And then once you reach them, what was that like? And how did they receive the idea of what you were doing? Well, they were extremely happy. Uh, even I, 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 I imagine that some of the members of the community are, are, are online right now here with us, that um, they were really happy. Uh, they, they organized a meeting uh, to receive me, to share some ideas, memories, showing me pictures of the family, uh, showing me photographs, postcards, personal letters, and personal documentation, where it is clear and state that the, the families uh, came from this part of, of uh, northwestern Iran. Uh, majority of the families came from uh, the villages uh, of Patamur, mainly. Uh, it's a very tiny village near the Urumi Lake. Um, then they were even flattered, uh, knowing that someone was interested in, in the life of, and the history of their community. And also they were very curious about the, the, the possibility to be in contact with other Kajians in, uh, and the, for example, the Kajian Cultural Center. They okay, that could be a great opportunity because we are here alone and, and we want to preserve and we want to say what we know about the history of our family. So uh, it, was, it was the best, best reception I could ever imagine. Oh, wow. That's amazing. We were so happy when we heard that because, you know, before you left, you weren't really sure how they were going to react, if they're going to receive, if they're going to be more private. So the fact that they were that excited to be, like we said, like kind of found, <laughs> you know, yeah. um, that, that's. So and I, I have to say, I, 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 they were very open to share that the family stuff with us. So I, I think we have to appreciate that. It's very, very important. Because it, it was the first contact that we had a meeting in person. And then the person who is not even a member of the community came here with many questions. And I, I have to be very, very, very honest. I also was a bit shocked about the, the positive reaction they had. And um, did, did some of them have, I, you sent us some documents and such, but has anybody there documented or have has like, maybe like um, a manuscript of any of the experiences of their ancestors or have they themselves kept any kind of diaries about the, their lineage or anything like that, that you know of? As, as far as I know, there is no such a kind of diary, but we have some personal letters that and based on that and based on other documents, we can begin to reconstruct uh, the, the, the trip. Uh, they, they, decided to to left Iran at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, they will, they received a lot of help from the Catholic Church, mainly from Spaniards, uh, Spaniards uh, priests who were working there. And then they, they traveled through the Caucasus, Northern Caucasus, mainly Georgia, uh, or that was in, 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 a, in, a, in a very complex situation at that time as well, as you know, and other through the Ottoman Empire. They, they reach Europe, and from Europe, they, they, they arrive to Argentina. And here in Argentina, they were received by also by the Lazarist uh, order. The Lazarist order was, I think, they, they had the, 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 the plan, I would say, the plan. Um, so the, they were, the, the, this trip was mainly based on the support of the Lazarus Order, the Catholic Church, and some Spaniards and French priests who were working in Iran at that time. That's what we know. And then we have some memories, but they are not very, because we still do not have a comprehensive way, but uh, it, is, it is confirmed by different sources and different families uh, were just completely it's like a puzzle. Yes, someone was saying a bit, another was adding a second stuff and all this, all the things. So, but this is, in, I mean, in a very general way, what you can say about how they reach Argentina, because this was a very, very inter interesting question. Yes, uh, why, why this group of people came to Argentina, not to the capital, but to a north, a, a very tiny village in the north part of Argentina. Imagine this city 100 years ago. Uh, so uh, how did they reach this, this city? And, and I think that we, I'm, I'm pretty confident that we're going to, to be able to reconstruct this trip 
because th this is something that we have to do is not only to rely on the on the material that these uh, families still have but also based on those on, on those memories and those documents try to go to a different archive yeah, the Lazarus archive the the uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs archive and, and try to, to to help us to understand a bit more about this. So Paulo, it seems that you know, based on the time frame that you said that they left the area, it was related, was it re was some of it related to the genocide that was taking place um over the time in, in those regions? Because we just finished a book club. Uh we had um Professor Emily Porter, who is in England, and we did this book club on memoirs of a Babylonian princess. And it was about a Chaldean woman who had to leave, um, who says that she has some Indian, uh, some origins from India. And, but, you know, she, she's a Chaldean in the northern, from the northern part of Iraq and uh, from Tilkepa. And uh, she, her family was um, very affected and, and uh, you know, persecuted because of their religion. And then she ended up leaving the country and going to uh, other parts of the Middle East and to Europe as well. And I'm just wondering, were there any stories that related? To, was that the major part of the reason that they left during that time? Well, I, I, I or, is it, or is it different? Is it like, did you yeah. receive different stories from different people? I would say that there's a mix uh, between the, the different, I mean, the, the causes of, uh, of the of the movement of this population. Uh, first of all, it, it seems that the, the idea to, to leave Iran was about uh, 1910. Uh, it seems that a, a group of the Chaldeans of, of, this, uh, of this part of the world uh, visited Rome and they were to, to was for help for the Catholic Church to leave this part. It was not only related to, to persecutions. Of course, there there were uh, some uh, um, ideas that, of course, it is not an, on a written way, but we can we can try to reconstruct. But uh, of course, it has to do as well. But um, as far as we can see, it, had, it was related mainly to the. the the lack of perspective, the economic crisis. And then we have a couple of letters that uh, confirm us. It, the, the, I mean, the, the milestone, the, the most important uh, event was the, the First World War. Because we have a, a very interesting letter where a, a, a person uh, tells uh, to another member of his family about the, the changes, the boundaries, how they, I mean, uh, we were part of Iran, then the Russians arrived and they help us. Then the Ottomans arrived and there was a war. Then the Iranians returned. They are, and so this situation is about, imagine, two or three years. It was, it was very complex. So the idea to, to leave the region was before uh, the persecution, was before the First World War. But then, of course, the, uh, after the, those uh, tragic events uh, took place, the, those families wanted even to, to they wanted to, uh, to abandon this place. And what we can say is that uh, those families arrived to Argentina in a period of time of more than 30 years, yes? Or we can say that the first families, not families, the men, the men arrived maybe 1910, then the, the, the wives and the kids arrived, and then the last families arrived in the, in the early 30s. So it's a long period of time where, first of all, the, the men alone, then the families uh, and then other families uh, arrived to Argentina in a period of 13 years and so But uh, again, it has to do with economic crisis, with social crisis, with persecution and uh, uh, regional uh, crisis. So I have a question here, and actually it's a very good question um, that Deborah Najar is asking, and she's wondering um, if these Chaldeans are from Iran or Iraq. And I think that's another thing that was, uh, you know, we often, I just did a story, by the way, for the Chaldean news uh, about Chaldeans in India. And we found out from a local person who lived in India, a local Chaldean, um, her name is Esma. We learned from her that there are there's a, a large community there. I had heard from it before, but she helped introduce us to the members so that we can interview them. And so when we looked into the history of that story, we saw that there's so much connection and how it started very long ago, how the uh, how they were Chaldeans, because I was trying to understand, well, were you Chaldeans before? Are you the same Chaldeans? But they're Chaldean Indian, they're Indians, 
but they have they follow the Chaldean um, faith and they consider themselves Chaldean, the Catholic faith. So we're kind of curious, how does this relate to us being Chaldean? Is it the same group? And I tried to look up the particular area that you said is um, from Iran. I could not find it. I did a quick search. I didn't go very deep because I was trying to see if that was that part of Mesopotamia before it was mm -hmm. uh, in 1921, before the British, you know, uh, changed the name to Iraq. So can you give us a little bit of background about that? I think that is a little bit of a we're talking about the community in Argentina as a new thing. But even in Iran, I know there are a lot of Chaldeans in Iran. But if, do you know the history of that that you can share for our audience to better understand it? Yes, of course. Well, three things. First of all, they refer themselves as Kaldan. That is 100% uh, of the family say that, well, my, my, my father, my, my grandfather say we were Kaldan. And this is, this is the first, uh, I mean, the, the point of departure, let's say that way. Uh, then they were, this is strong, strong Catholic identity. Uh, but since they were a very tiny community, when they arrived to Argentina, they unfortunately, they lose many of the Chaldean customs and liturgy because they were Romanized, let's say. They were they were living in a, in a, in a very small town. They were Catholic, 100%. So they say, okay, we're going to go to the mass, but the, since we do not have a priest, we're going to have the uh, uh, Roman Latin Catholic priest, not, not a Chaldean, uh, Chaldean priest. So this is that. Then they preserve the Syriac language um, and for at least two generations, uh, at least a, a group of them. Now, uh, what we can say that the, some of the, of the members of this community, they still remember some prayers or isolated words or expressions, but unfortunately there is not a single member of the community who still have, have the opportunity to, to speak uh, Syria. Um, well, in 2019, died, died the last member of this community who can uh, could spoke in Syria. And he was a kind of tra official translator of the member of the community. Um, yes, they, they were, they, they, they came from villages near the, the, the Lake Urbien, which is Iran, and which is the south, near Salmas, Khosroba, uh, um, Patamur, it's very, very tiny villages that uh, today, today, uh, as far as I know, there is not a, there are not a very uh, important uh, villages or centers, but uh, they came from what were in the, in the 100 years ago, 100% uh, Christians um, villages in, in that part of Iran. Ah, okay, and there was, a, as according to, to some of the members of, of those families, they, they, they say that uh, the parents used to say that there were also a, a group of uh, Jewish families living among them as well. That's, that's pretty interesting. Oh, that is very interesting too. Yeah, because that was the case um, I also had read another book, My Father's Paradise, where he talks about the Jewish yeah. and the Christian communities and the Muslim communities living in the villages in the northern area. And they really, at that time, lived in harmony. And uh, probably th that community had experienced the same thing. So it seems like because based on the, they were fairly small, because they were small, that they didn't create like how other communities where they created their no. own church, they didn't, they couldn't expand too much on their community. So it also seems like they didn't continue to bring immigrants or to bring their, um, like other family members did not follow them. Is that why they kind of maintain that same smallness and size? Yes, you're right. They, they, they were not able to, to build up a community or to bring other people or, or the extended family to Argentina. But some members of this community visited Iran and sometimes other parts of the Middle East where um, other members of the of extended families were living. Actually, uh, I, they showed me some photographs of members of the communities who visited Iran until even, let's say, the Iranian Revolution. And that's, that's a very important issue because until the, let's say, uh, late 70s, um, some members of this community managed to visit Iran. Some of them stayed there with the families for a couple of months or even years. One of the members of the community is, is, it was living in Tabriz in Iran for a couple of years. Um, the, uh, but then after the, the Iranian revolution, the Iran-Iraq war in the 80s, 
they they they, they start being in contact with these members of the family, and then it has to do with the with the uh, with the new generation that they are fully integrated into Argentinian society. They were losing this part of the identity. It is quite understandable, of course, that. Uh, right. So, Paulo, you you spent um, quite a bit of time with them. Even before that, you were already researching this topic, and you've spent some time with them. And there's a possibility that you would either revisit or reconnect somehow. Uh, what are, you know, what are the pos uh, uh, the future possible ways to document um, these people's stories and to to hear their stories um, to also shed light on, you know. Th th not only like their current stories, but I mean, even learn about their descendants, like their names. I know you said one of the members that you had talked to, he was wondering if we might know some people that they're related. Chaldeans are like that, by the way. I, I have such a hard time keeping up with that. But the first <laughs> when they see you, who are, who are you the daughter of? And then they try to trace it back many generations back. And yeah. my memory is like, how do you, you know, it's, it's really an art, but it's something that is very valuable to them. So when you tell that about one of the people, my heart, like I was just so touched because that's one of the things that we care so much about. Um, so for, for us to do something, what, what's, what do you see a possible future for that? Well, possibly future regarding the activities, it would be to conduct interviews to, to try to, to recall those uh, the memories of, of those families. Uh, actually, we began. We have just the very first interview. We're trying to edit and, and, to, and to and to translate into English, uh, of course, and then uh, to gather and to organize the majority of the artifacts of those families and force carry forward perhaps uh, documents, letters, um, and to reconstruct reconstruct from an academic point of view, the history of the community. And then I think it is very relevant to not only to add this a new piece of the patchwork of the Argentinian society that we are, we are not aware of, but also try to help this community and the descendants to, to, to be in contact with other Kazians. And, and I think that would be great because uh, they deserve to be part of the, of the Kazian diaspora. That's amazing. Thank you so much for the work again. Like, I mean, you you started this. It was a wonderful idea and you kept going with it. A lot of good ideas come along, but people don't necessarily follow through or, or execute them. But you've really hung on to the story. And um, I just, you know, I want to know, like, if you have any last thoughts, uh, I, words for our community or the community in general for the Chaldean community based on what you just experienced through this whole process. Uh, well, I, I only have to, to thank the Kajia Cultural Center for, for the interest in this activity, and I hope we can continue working on that and try to uh, to build up and, uh, and to reconstruct this, this part of the Kajia and the diaspora in Argentina in South America. Thank you so much, Paulo. Next time we'll have you on with one of the Chaldeans from Argentina. Okay. That would be great. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have a wonderful day.